Hey. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Uh, my no, that's okay. I, I was also explaining that, you know, I've been trailing you for the last 15 minutes from when you were in traffic. I was like, okay, let's wait. I followed you home. <laughs> you know, so I really do appreciate the flexibility in terms of being able to join us today. I really do honor you and I thank you for that. Thank you. So we, we it's our honor to thank have you. So, you. so whatever happens, you know, we, we would just adapt to whatever is going on. So I know it's a uh, about 5.24 past, your, you've had a full day at the office and you're just ju getting them and joining us. So thank you, you're I appreciate right. that. Thank right. you. So yes, so I was just introducing um, you to say you're the Senior Special Advisor to the Governor of Kano on Lagos Affairs. So, you know, tell us what does that job entail? <laughs> Um, thank you, uh, thank you for having me. And um, it's senior special assistant to the assistant, governor okay. of Kano State on Lagos Affairs. Um, in 2018, um, a partnership between um, governors Ambode, that's the Lagos State Governor, and Governor Gandu J, Ablai Gandu J, the Kano State Governor on um, economic investments between both states. Uh, both governors had realized that um, given the World Bank ratings um, for doing business in Nigeria, Kano and Lagos had um, more, of, um, more to do, so to say. So, uh, and the ratings of both states being um, two of the biggest commercial states had had its impact uh, together and individually on the World Bank report. So we thought, okay, let's come together, let's sign a partnership for economic growth, uh, partnerships, sustainability, knowledge sharing, investment opportunity, and all of that. So my the office of the senior special assistant to the Kano State Governor was born out of that uh, partnership that I was signed. You know, so. I'm responsible for the people, assets, and properties of Kano states here in Lagos. I'm also responsible for investment opportunities, public and private partners that are interested in coming to Kano, you know, and uh, some cases, um, persons in Kano that are interested in coming to Lagos, you know, that do not understand the, the terrain of the market. So that's what I do. Wow, I mean that's a ma massive one because most people really, um, they they see Lagos, right? But they may not understand that uh, from an if we talk about an intra intra Nigerian trade dynamics, that um, other states actually trade a lot with Lagos as well, right? And one thing you also talked about in some of our previous events was realizing that even the commercial center in Lagos a lot of indigenous of Kano are actually active in Lagos commerce. <laughs> That's <laughs> right? correct. That's uh, correct. Right. And you were in, the, in those sessions too, you were talking about, you know, some of the major markets in Lagos are actually led by the people from Kano. Correct. That was, that correct. was, I mean, that was news to yes. me and I'm sure it's, it's to yes. surprise some people. Yes. Yes. Toyin, you're correct. Um, there is a local government here in Lagos. Um, there's a center here in Lagos called Agege. Mm -hmm. Agege mm -hmm. is one of the biggest community um, residents to, to Kano State indigents. Right. Why is that? Uh, when I first... Okay, I was born in Lagos. I mean, naturally, I'm born in Lagos. But I grew up in Kano, so to say. So I, I met a friend of mine that told me he was in Lagos. So I went to see him. So I went to Agege and I looked at everywhere, you know, where people are actually new growing up. I was like, ah. What I, are you I, guys I, doing in Lagos? You know, like, ah, <laughs> we, we've always been in Lagos. We just come to Kano. Um, um, the first settlers of, um, of the Kano state in the, or rather the Arewa people that migrated to Lagos. Uh, were from Kano. They came in um, via the train, the rail lines. 
that mm. came into trade in, in Lagos. So they settled in Agege. That was in 1823, 18, no, 1832. They settled mm. in Lagos. So for those of them that could not return back or did not return back, they came to Lagos and they intermarried. So they moved from Agege, Rabat, that's the real with Lagos, Agege to Idiaraba, to Apapa, to Mushin, you know, they, they kept going. So you have the Maltu market. The mm. Maltu market here in Lagos is, uh, is um, the chairman of the Maltu market from Kanu State. Um, wow. The chairman of the Beru de Change in Lagos is from Kanu State. Most of the Beru de Change owners here in Lagos are from Kanu State. Then wow. you have my prominent indigenous. I call them my because it's also my responsibility to know them. Um, Dangote um, is here in Lagos. Bua is here in Lagos. Uh, Amazuma Petroleum, uh, Asman. Asman has got family roots here too in Lagos. So yes, um, yeah, <laughs> Lagos family. <laughs> And, and I, I can say I can say the huge pride, <laughs> the huge pride <laughs> because <laughs> yes. Yes. I love it. I love it. And I, you know, I was also sharing before we went live. I was sharing with you that unfortunately, we in the diaspora, because of the, the work that I do, we in the diaspora, if all we are doing is reading the newspaper and the sensationalized media about Nigeria, we don't connect, we don't see people like you, we don't see the work on ground, which is why I developed all of these platforms, I call it alternative platforms, alternative sources of trade and investment news, because what people are reading out there is not encouraging at all about our dear, you know, Nigeria. And that's why, you know, Nigeria Investment Conference, you know, when when you or you joined us as well, thank you for that as well, bringing the, the, the game changers. How do we make sure that the world sees you and the work you're doing? Because right now, the newspapers and the traditional medias, it's, 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 not, it's not telling us the real things, the exciting things that, um, you know, you and I talk about every day. Yes, I, I agree with you, Tony. Um, you know, we, we, when we first met, we, we were in a session for the summit I, I put together, the um, Tannery Summit, the Letter Summit. Yes. yes. You see, it was interesting. I, 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 it blew my mind when I went to Agege and I got into, it's a hall. When I say it's a hall, like, you know, the dormitory right. where you have beds and everything, it's a hall, a hall of persons all making shoes, slippers, wallets, belts. And I was like, ah. Mm. So I now had to ask them, where did you just get your leather from? This is beautiful. I mean, we're branding it. And some of them said they got from... Uh, Mushin, some say from Kanu, from all that. Now, Kanu, in my interest you to know, like I said at, at the summit, there are 36 um, tires in Tanaris in Nigeria, and 22 of them are in Kanu State. Mm. I, I had to do extensive research, extensive research, and I found out that this, these guys from Italy come to Nigeria to Kano to buy leather. The guy from China come to Nigeria to buy leather. They finish the goods and they sell them handbags and shoes to us and everything. You know, and that was when it hit. I said, we need to start changing the narrative, start telling people, start putting mm -hmm. it out there. So I totally agree with you. The media Yes, it's not always out there about the good things um, Nigeria is, you know, or is doing, you know, uh, and all of that. Diaspora, those people responsible for diaspora, they are trying, I can give you that. Um, Mrs. Abike Dabiri, she's trying her best a whole lot, you know, to bring positive news, but not enough. Now, without research no one at that summit ever knew 
mm. that Louis Vuitton, Gucci, and the likes were coming to Nigeria to Kano State to buy that mm. to, to do their handbags, you know. Right. So, so I agree with you that we 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 need to change the narrative. We need to use some sort of what is available to us for the media to push it out. Right, right. And it's it's about, I mean, there's ex, what, one thing we call export promotion. There's also investment promotion. These are all activities that the West, they do it very well and they do it every day. And that's why you have to protect the brand image because just by saying the word Italy, okay, in the marketplace, in the global arena, in people's mind, they start thinking Whoa. about Italian pasta, you know, luxury, tourism, yes. right? Yes. Okay. But when, we, but when we talk about Africa, okay, the imagery people come up with is war, famine, disease. When we say Nigeria, Nigeria that is home to over 200 million people, in people's mind, it says a story, but is the truth. Those stories have commercial commercial implications. Yeah. Up or down. Yeah. Up yeah. or down. That's one. The second thing is we should not allow other people to tell our stories for us. True. Because at the end of the day, like they say, you know, if you leave the story to the hunter, you know, he's going to tell his own story, not, not the story of the lion, <laughs> right? No. So no. we cannot leave our stories because as Africans, as Nigerians, just look at the global landscape now. Our brand, what does Nigeria as a brand stand for? We all have responsibilities to tell that story because it reflects on the work we do. You talk about leather. You also educated me, right? I've been educated by you that, you know, globally, when you look at the top highest quality in terms of leather, Nigeria stands there, top 10 in the world. Top 10. That, that in itself is something we should be spreading the news about, which is yeah. which which links directly to, to your office because your state is responsible for that productivity. True. Sure. Right? You know, and, and interestingly, I know the last time we met as well, one of the major tannery owners, I've, you know, I've inter, um, interacted with him when we met in Cairo. Um, yeah, he said so. He said so, right? So I also see that Kano is playing not just in Nigeria, but internationally and regionally beyond just Nigeria. So that's fantastic. So that's why I think even the community that I lead, we're trying to provide education and, and um, insights, market insights, so that they know what the numbers look like. The other thing I believe you also educated me on was, um, you know, when you look at Nigeria's GDP, what leather industry is contributing to that GDP? Do you want to talk a little about that? Um, okay. Um, so, um, we know that the government of the day has decided to focus more on agriculture. Mm. And uh, because oil, oil isn't, isn't it's what it used to be anymore. Right. Um, one of the things that um, um, governors of uh, the North are focusing on is uh, um, and most especially the cattle, cattle rearing, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, like, like, let me speak for Kanu State. In Kanu State, the governor has come up with a ranching system. He's got a vast okay. land, you know, and what he's done is he asked the the cattle uh, rearers, the he the the heads or in the media they are known as the headsmen, to to bring their cattle. They will be in the ranch. He's creating what you call the end processing system where the cattle are fed there is milk got from the cattle which production milk production abattoir meat production the horns are used for medicines uh, um, the hoops too are used for 
medicines. Then you have the ladder that goes into process. So it's an end-to-end -end process, value chain process, you know, which in turn increases the GDP. Now, if you remember, Al Haji Gam, one of the speakers at the summit, mentioned that one of the that in as much as a uh, more is a viable export to Nigeria, the mm. leather industry too, the leather industry too is a viable export, you know, right. to Nigeria, you know. So, so yes. Um, that said, we we believe that um agriculture the leather industry can improve the gdp you know for for nigeria as a nation you know um reducing the dependency on oil exports you right. know so yes fantastic so um you also talked about youth you know, the last time we spoke back in, was it October of 2020? You talked yes, about October, some youth yes. programs, yes. Um, enterprise, like entrepreneurship programs you were trying yes. to um, create. Yes. How, how is that yes. going? Uh, okay. Um, COVID. 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 Yeah. COVID. Okay. So I, I'll just run you through the idea of the youth program. Um, there's a saying where I'm from. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, by birth, I'm from I'm from Lagos State. By should I say study growing up and everything, I'm a northerner, but I'm naturally from um, Delta State. Now, there's a saying in Delta State in worry. They say worry not the carry last. Mm. But I actually sat down and I noticed that the people that tell you that worry not the carry last are the people that have never been out of worry. Mm. They've never gone to see competition. Competition. They've never left worry to see how competitive it is for them to run a race and actually carry last. Wow. And when they carry the last, they would improve, compete with themselves and become better. Mm. Now, why did I say that? I looked at Kano State, the North. I looked at issues of this unrestiveness between the youth. And I came up with the same ideology that most of these youths have not been able to meet competitors outside. They've not had that opportunity. Mm. So I came up with the idea. I said, okay, there are youths in Kano State that want to fix phones. They are technicians, they are engineers, you know, they are young girls that believe because they are from the north, they cannot be makeup artists or event planners and all of that. So I said to myself, innovate Kano. Mm. That's it, innovate Kano. So the Innovate Kano program is going to be, we're looking at taking 130 young Kano State enterprising youths down to Lagos and say, okay, this is Lagos. You've heard about Lagos. Have you ever been to Lagos? No. That's one criteria we're using to, to get them. Another criteria is um, what sort of businesses or enterprise uh, uh, sector or um, thing they are interested in doing. Come to Lagos, see what is making Lagos famous. Mm. See why people are buying and selling in Lagos. Mm. They stay here in the boot camp for like three months, then they go back to Kano. Now, for those that have come to Lagos and have gone to see um, a place like Akbobo where you have fast-moving goods. Mm. So when they come, they say, okay, I can come to Lagos and supply because mm -hmm. Lagos is a consumer state. Okay, mm. there's a market for my jewelries here. There's a market for gold here. There's a market for leather here. There's a market for eggs, for cattle, for meat, for, you know, there's a market now. You have come here, you've seen the market. There's another part of it. You go back to Kano and create what you've seen here. So, for instance, mm -hmm. I spoke to the, to the MD of Vita for, and I said, sir, I'm bringing this youth. And he said, ah, bring them to me. Please let them come. When they leave, they will be able to 
become franchisee franchise of them in Kano State. Dance, you know, who who mm. help them set up stores, you know, to promote vital form. You know, so I've also met others say bring them. You know, let us start our small computer village in Kano. Let us have our brand brought to Kano. You know, and all of so it's a two way thing. For those that want to do business in Lagos and for those that want to do business in Kano, it's going to be open. So when these guys come, they are taking something back to Kano. So that's the whole idea of Innovate Kano. Fantastic. And I, I try to tell people that when it comes to economic development, economic development is not just a federal conversation. It's actually land. It's, it's a grassroots initiative, right? Yeah, because a yeah. lot of times people are always looking at the federal government, they're always saying Abuja, Abuja, Abuja. But at the end of the day, even AFCFTA implementation, economic development is a city by city, state by state conversation. I agree, I agree with right? you. I, so a lot I of times, yeah, the conversation you and I are having now to a lot of people is very strange. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because on the international stage or in the regional states on the continent, when you talk about Nigeria, they just talk about Nigeria as a whole. Right? People don't spend time to say, okay, what's even the makeup of Nigeria? Right? Let's open exactly. the hood and let's start understanding the mechanisms. When we say, okay, trade with Nigeria, you're actually going to be trading with people in certain states, sitting at certain desks, exactly. whether Lagos when we talk about KB rice, when you think about Kano. So even this conversation, I hope it's not the last. I hope even investment promotion agency, NIPC, I know they were at my event. I hope they, they yes. see this. And I know um, on, on the honorable from NIPC as well. These are part of the conversations we need to have is that Nigeria is massive, <laughs> right? Yes. And yes, the work totally. that you all are doing is lost. Yes, it's yes. locked totally under the umbrella of Nigeria. Yes, it's I locked. totally agree with you. For um, instance, uh, yeah, for instance, Kano State has 44 local governments. Mm. One of the criteria we're using for the Innovate Kano is to select um, young people from each of these local governments. Now, by the time these young people come to Lagos from each local government, which is actually spread spread out, like um, in Kano, um, the drive from one local government to the other is about four hours. Wow. You know, that's the landmark, you know. So, we're picking 40, from the 44 local governments. Now, by the time these young people go back to their individual local government, they will be impacting it from the grassroots. Grassroots. Per local government. Mm. Do you understand? Now, this program I'm talking about is a three-year program, and in a year we would have coming um, twice in a year, you know, because we'll have a break in between. Now, you can imagine three years, 130 times two a year. I mean, I mean, what 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 are we saying? We've impacted the grassroots from exactly. the grassroots. Now, right. with that knowledge. With that impact, if these people decide that, okay, I want to take my business to Dubai, I want to take my business outside Nigeria, I want to take my business outside to Africa or somewhere in, in Europe, they are getting investors and uh, uh, interested persons, partners coming to their local governments, the grassroots. <laughs> Do you understand? The yep. grassroots. Because when these people come to Kanu, they won't just come to Kanu, boom, as a state. Exactly. They will go to that local government where it's located. Right. So you know, the, yeah. the African free trade uh, uh, um, stock actually impacts, should impact, I would say, from the grassroots up. Right. Up. Right. And, I, and even we need to also learn from places like Dubai within the UAE is that investments would also land at the grassroots because even here in the US, it's the same. That's why you have breakout cities. When you say breakout city, you have Chicago, where I am. What you think about California, you think about like each city, they have public sector, private sector engagement to attract investment at the city level. 
I think that's one of the things a lot of African countries are missing, where even AFCFTA, for example, is sitting at the federal level in Abuja, right? Mm. It, what I tell people is, if it remains in Abuja, all you're doing is you're moving paper. <laughs> you're having cool. committee, me committee meetings, cool. you're moving cool. paper, you're talking agenda, you're just talking in air-conditioned rooms, right? If you actually want to implement, if you want to actualize AFTA, AAFCFTA, you need to take that agenda and take it back to the grassroots. Because youth, empower, youth empowerment, women empowerment, um, economic development is not just a story for Abuja. It's a story for Kano. It's a story for KB. It's a story for Lagos. And that's one of the things at the continental level we're also shedding light on. Like the federal, they're holding on to AFCFT as their personal agenda. And I'm telling you, it's, it's going nowhere. <laughs> All you're yeah. going to be doing is you'll be looking at numbers. You'll be like, oh, AFCFT, we signed the agreement, check. Oh, we did media support check, and you're looking good on paper, but nobody's impacted across the nation. Correct, correct, correct. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I totally agree with you. And um, one one thing I believe is my my office um, creates. You see, my office is already set up for state partnerships. Now, yes, it's for two states, but I can tell you to him for a fact that I've all I've had representatives of other states speak to me and say, Wow, what happens when you're done? Would you want to go to another state? Would you want to move? I said, see, I, it's 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 a welcome development. But I think if state governors and the federal gov government has this same ideology to impact the F C F T A from the grassroots upwards. Yes. We would actually be trading with the right people. Right. The right people will be transferring knowledge. The right people will be trading. I mean, you have a place like Bainway State, for instance. I was speaking to a friend recently, and he was telling me that, please, you are in Lagos. I know you work with the Kano State government, but can you help us get investors like Chivita? <laughs> to bring with me. I was like, what do you need Chivita for? I was like, fruits, fruits, food baskets. It's it's wasting. Yes, they have the land, the land is fertile, they have fruits, it's the food capital of you know food. They don't have a single juice factory. <laughs> they don't have a single juice factory. That's insane. What they have I Oh my Lovely goodness. Mangoes. Oh God. Oh my gosh. I, I apologize. Sorry. No, no, you even know? even me, I'm I'm carried away. Even I have to apologize because here's the bottom line. I think the opportunities abound. Okay. The opportunities abound. We've you and I have already talked about the lack of awareness about the opportunities, even within the diaspora. Because again, you're not going to hear this on main headline. You're not going to see this front front, um, front report and say, oh, Kano industry, top 10 in the world. <laughs> but I did send you um, an article yesterday where Vogue, yes. Vogue, yes. Vogue was covering the leather industry. And it's really, yes. you know, you can't talk about the leather industry in Africa without even mentioning Kano or Nigeria. Yes. You can't. Yes. Because Nigeria really beautiful. is the leather industry in Africa, that right? Was a beautiful article, actually. You saw that? Yeah. Yeah. So those are the types of stories that needs to come out that we need to tell the world because that is actually how you attract investors. Because investors are looking for, they are seeking investment opportunities. And I tell people, if you go to investors and say, oh, I need, I need investor, I need, they are going to run away from you. Why? It's just like people saying, I need money. I'm begging for money. But investors, if you approach them and say, okay, we have an investment opportunity in Kano or in Lagos or in Benue that we want to present to you. Can we set up an appointment? They're like, wow, let's talk. Because investors are looking, always seeking investment opportunities that gives them arrow high sure. so everything that we do and we, which is part of why i now train government officials on the continent is 
they need to prioritize investment promotion. They need to prioritize export promotion. They need to be clear what it is that they need, right? What it is that they want and what it is that they have to offer regional and global markets. Because one of the things we do as Nigerians, you know, we have this Nigerian pride. <laughs> and this is what that pride is. We are the giants of Africa. They should oh, know. No. no more giants. <laughs> Everybody no. has dwarfs. So. No, ah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. We let us still be dreaming, please. Let us dream. Uh, no, drinks ah. are good. Drinks are good, and I think, and I think, and I think, uh, maybe we, as dwarfs, is good no. to, dream, to dream as giants. To dream, as our giants. <laughs> hey, we are dreaming, you know. Let us hey, dream hey, now. Hey, the cloud is becoming smaller for us. <laughs> yeah, here's, here's, here's the beautiful thing, though. I think we all need to always remember, and this is the less, biggest lesson, is that the real value, the real asset of Nigeria is not the land, it's the people. Yeah. That's really the great asset that we, we haven't invested enough in and we're not tapping into. And I tell you, when we start connecting and doing meaningful work with together, the sky is the limit. Yeah, right? it is. It's not, it's not the oil, which we do. I mean, it's not the gold. We have that. We have a lot of, Nigeria has a lot of natural resources and, you know, that we've not even tapped. <laughs> uh, you know? Toyin, Toyin, recently, uh, my, my twin sister relocated. Mm. from the uk and they've been there for 20 years wow. and um, a friend of mine asked me said why would your twin sister relocate when i'm i'm looking to go and i said ah mm. have you ever wondered why the chinese they keep flooding nigeria wow why people are coming in i mean these foreigners are actually coming in to, right to look for investment opportunities to look for to sign up jvs and partnerships is because there is something here we have ignored. Mm. We're not seeing. Mm. You <sighs> see, you spoke about. Uh, uh, we, we, we're still doing a research to find the, the people that, that own butter. Mm. You see, we spoke about value chain, about production, about supply and everything. Yes, we have the guys making. The, the shoes, the leather shoes, wallets and everything. You can get them to brand it and all of that. And yes, there's a market. But the truth about it is we can only do small scale mm. right now. We can only small scale. small scale. And even those doing small scale cannot even meet demands. They cannot meet up demands from, from uh, people they are supplying in Nigeria, not to talk of. International. Outside. Yes, you know. The truth is, we have capacity. We we know we have the people, but maybe not the right investments. Capacity you know, development. To create, yes, to create the, the capacity. Yes. yes. And what you're saying really is is actually what also led me to start doing a lot more teaching and master classes and education. Because after in, in, in engaging for years, what you just said is, 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 the, is the actual reality today. We know where we are today and we, we can see the future we are aspiring towards. But there's a gap between where we are and how do we get there. And sure. part of what I have seen, to be honest, is actually um, why I do training like um, how to build a global brand and business. Like a lot of times people see me put those things together and they don't understand what Tony is saying is that international trade development at the end of the day, the foundation is business development. True. The only difference is you are taking your business across the border. True. So what I'm finding is that even business development, um, foundational things, we have to take a look at the foundation right now of how we're building businesses in, in, in the, on the continent. And if those businesses are set up to scale to international level 
So th those are the things that is driving me because for me, coming into this narrative from where I'm coming from, I already see the numbers. I was already dealing in like live auctions and global sourcing at, at scale. So when I came out, I was like, trade with Africa, trade with Africa. And I was like, oh, oh, wait a minute. Who, who is ready to even trade at that level, at that scale? I couldn't find. Yeah. And even when you find manufacturers, they really have to start changing the mindset because I tell people there are three markets, your local market, your regional market, your, your global market. Just because you're winning in Nigeria today doesn't mean you can take the same mindset and then compete internationally. There needs to be a mindset shift, which is what we are doing now with the programs, our training, AFCFTA training, AGOA, because even AGOA, African Growth and Opportunity Act, under AGOA, you can bring in leather without paying duty in the US. Oh. Yeah, zero tariff. It's going to expire by 2025. But for 20 years, like meat, shaki, all those things, there are about 6,000 products that you could literally import into the US with zero tariff and without quota. Wow. Interesting. And what we are finding is that people are not using it. People don't know they're they not using it. Are they aware? I'm sorry? Are they aware? Are they aware? Like, exactly. And, who, and whose job is it to educate them? <laughs> ah, because, because now that I'm aware, any meat my, my wife serves me in my plate, I will export. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> you remember Pomo? Pomo cannot be exposed. <laughs> you remember that story? <laughs> Instead of leather, we're actually eating our Pomo. <laughs> Yes, that is why that is why they can't meet up the demands of leather because they're not enough. Yes, yes. We're eating up, we're eating up the heights. Right. Oh, and and I see people joining. You remember the the mentee I told you about from Kaduna? I also she's yes. she's a batter. I see her joining as well. She's joining from Tudunwada Kaduna, and she's an example of one of the success stories of the work we do in coaching. Um, exporters, even wherever they're at, whether they're big or medium or, or just starting. And she's been able to successfully, you know, start serving the international market. She's a fashion designer, um, you know, more like a startup. But she successfully exported like things like um, face masks. She has clients now in the U.S. So she's, 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 she's what's, yes, she's, she's an example of what I'm saying you can sit in your house. China knows this very well. India knows this. That you, you don't have to even physically travel. I know COVID has challenges, right? But through international trade, you can have, if you're part of platforms like ours, and you take the type of training, we can train you in terms of how to do international trade. When you have the training, when you have the capacity, you can start where you are. You don't have to be big. You can start where you are. And guess what? When those people start sending you those dollars, you'll be laughing to the bank. <laughs> mm. Like, and you won't even be thinking about Abuja. Again, grassroots. Because imagine now, if you say buy from Nigeria, whoever you're buying, you, you, you bypass government. You, you, you know, the only way government gets paid is through taxes. Yes. So even, yes. So even in my class, one of the slides in my class, I talk about personal wealth and national wealth. You know, how do you get the two? Because sometimes I think, for example, Nigeria, the last 20, 30 years, they focused more on national wealth, which is more government resources, mm -hmm. government projects, government contracts, all of that. It was all about government, government. But the future is about the private sector wealth. How regular people on the streets of Nigeria can provide goods and services to one another or people across Nigeria, or people in the international market, and make money from it. China has produced more wealth in the last 20, 30 years on that trade than in the last 200 years. So people need to separate. So every time now people want to be in government, I get it. But that's the last 20, 30 years of Nigeria in terms of the oil resources. Oil money doesn't get into the hands of the people, technically. Right? The only way a regular Nigeria would partake of oil money is through infrastructure projects that the government put together. It's not, or if you're employed by the government. But 
individual wealth in the private sector is what all the other countries work towards. How can we create more dangotes? That's the question. How do we create more dangotes? And that's the story of entrepreneurship. Right? If you can provide value, if you can provide services, if you can provide products, it doesn't matter who is buying. Let us open international markets to you. Just keep selling and exporting your talent, your resources, and get paid. That, that's right. what other, other regions of the world, that's what, if, if, if that becomes the number one agenda of Nigeria, an African leader, that's it. That's it. You, you start realizing that the people, if, in fact, if you can unlock 200 million people in Nigeria, or even a fraction, if 25% of Nigerians can be unlocked into entrepreneurship, regional and global entrepreneurship, I'm telling you, whether through technology skills, services, banking, that's it. That's it. <laughs> that's it. You know, you know, Tony, I, I spoke to the guy that was at your investment um, talk, uh, the FTA guy. Mm -hmm. And I said, I think we should, like, like um, the national youth policy that was um, put together last year, uh, it was created as an app, um, little leaflets and like that, so that the youth can get involved. I think they should educate from the grassroots. It's grassroots. You know? on the AFTA uh, um, um, policy or the, the, the trade opportunities, yeah. you know. I, I, I think it's not about, like you said, it's not about Abuja, but I, I don't know. Let's let's see what happens. It, it yeah. just started early this year. I, I, yes. You know what I also tell people, though, in Nigeria, particularly in Nigeria, I tell them privately, and now I'm sharing, sharing it publicly. I'm saying the more you wait by December of this year, if Nigerians don't get it right, don't worry. Morocco, they are coming. Egypt, Egypt oh. they are coming. South Africa, they are coming. They are, everybody is all focused on Nigeria. So I, I speaking of speaking of Morocco, do you know during my research, I found out that the Moroccan leather is Nigerian. Is Nigerian? Yes, it's from Ghana. Yeah. Yeah, and they're coming for more. So under ASCFTA, people need to understand. They are coming more. Every every other country we talk about now, because ASCFTA is really about export development. So if you do not develop your exports, you cannot benefit from ASCFTA. No, you can you cannot you cannot. Right. So they have developed their exports, and the target destination market is Nigeria. <laughs> So, so, so I tell people privately, but now I'm saying it publicly and I'm laughing. I say, don't worry. Just go and sit down. Just don't, don't even do anything. By December, just wait. You start calling me. You start all the land you refuse to buy. They are coming and they are coming with their banks. Fully yes. financed. Yeah. You know, they are, yeah. I mean, forget it. They are, I mean, like this, I sense the seriousness because I do a lot, like in October, I actually trained um like 14 countries representatives from 14 countries government officials on afcfta they they are seriously seriously organized the um the sense of urgency is clear they are looking to grow their gdp the government bank and private sector they are all on the same page so literally they were just looking waiting for january 1 so as we speak right now, people are in strategy meetings, breaking down Nigeria and seeing where they're going to, how they're going to penetrate the Nigerian so, market. So, so Tony, if, if I may ask, so what do you think we need to do here in Nigeria? I mean, even your advice, even from my office, what do you I think, think we need to do? Yeah, I think it's, it's simple. Under AFCFTA, you cannot really, technically, you cannot control what's coming in because you've opened your market. Okay? Sure. You, can, you cannot, because the whole point of AFCFTA is lower barriers to entry into your market. So sure. the, the, sure. Real, the real game changer 
is to also see that the African market is bigger than Nigerian market. Even though Nigerian market is big, it's almost like tit for tat. So it's organizing Kano, your Kano indigens, and helping them to penetrate other countries. That's the biggest thing. And one way to do it, because when you look at the entire continent, it becomes massive. Just pick your top three countries. Top three strategic countries mapped to your top three strategic products coming out of Kano. Just like you are doing for Lagos. But you have to, um, it, it has to be strategic. Like it has to be, you have to map out um, how you want to grow it over, say, five years. To say every year we're going to increase our export of XYZ to this country 20% every year. By year 2025, 20, 2026, 20, we want to have grown it to this level of investment, right? And how do we do it? We, we want distributorship for this letter. We want to open branches of cano, cano, cano businesses. We want ex so you have to list those things out. And that, when you do build that strategy, then it becomes executable, right? Mm. So so you you cannot control who is going to come into cano. But, wow. you can, but you can because AFCFT, you've you've basically said tit for tat. Yeah. Like yeah. we are giving up, we are giving up our local market in exchange for the bigger African market, right? Because the African market is quite sizable. It's bigger than Nigeria. So what then happens is, which country are you going to help Kano penetrate? And what product are you going to push into those markets aggressively? Mm. That, because when you can do that, guess what's going to happen? Employment will go up in your, in your city. Again, grassroots. Right, because if businesses in Kano can get more business externally, then definitely employment goes up. That's the secret for the nuts. That's really the secret for the nuts. You need employment to go up. All the youth, you need job creation. And the risk, the way you, you get that engine going is industrialization. And to you cannot industrialize if there's no demand for what it is you're producing. So what, sure. AS, sure. what ASTFTA has done is to artificially create demand. Mm. That's that's really what people people are not seeing is that it has artificially because if I come to you now and I say I want to buy, I want to buy a million pieces of whatever it is you are produce, what you are going to do is you take that demand, you take it to the bank, you borrow against it. And you go to the factory line and you start producing because there are legal things you've signed that says when you produce this, you, be, you get paid. That's what China is doing. They buy into the future. People are buying future farmlands. Like, like you talked about Bainway, right? It's what as a buyer, I'm not looking, uh, I'm not looking for what Bainway can give me today. I'm looking for what I can lock in with Bainway the next two, three years. True. Right? Right. And, and then you can work on global gap. You can work on all these international um, agricultural things to make sure that it's not just that you're producing mango, but it's that, you know, your, the farm practices, you know, the fertilizer and all the pesticide, whatever it is you're spraying on that farmland actually meets the demands of the international market. And that's why people can buy from you. So all of these things are dynamic. And I'm telling people, I'm seeing a lot of people talk, talk, talk online. But I'm telling you, people need to talk less and start doing strategy discussion. And I tell people, well, if you I don't agree. do it, if you don't do it, just, just wait till December. You're going to call me back. And you'll be like, ah, ah, they've bought the land. Ah, Oko Bababi. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they don't exactly. <laughs> you it's know, over. it's over. And, you know, Ghana, Ghana has this, um, I'm so much enjoying this, you can tell. Ghana has this rule which is one of the brilliant rules. No matter who, who buys a land in Ghana, a foreigner, after 99 years, it goes back to the people. I don't know if Nigeria has oh. that. Yes, Ghana has that rule, which is part of protecting the, the uh, property of the land. Uh, not, not to my knowledge. Yeah, but Ghana, Ghana has it that you can buy this land, but it's really not a 99-year lease. 
It's a 99 year lease. One of the things, if I remember well, yeah. 99 year so, lease. So, it's I a nine, if, you are, if, if you are non indigenous if you are not a citizen of Ghana. Because if you don't have that, in the next 5, 10, 20 years, your land may never belong to Nigerians anymore. It's gone. Right? It's gone. Right? Because, yeah, because, and the other thing I also tell people, like, this is the real conversations diaspora need to have themselves. The work you refuse to do foreigners international will come and do it which is fine but guess what they're going to control the epicenter of manufacturing and whoever controls manufacturing actually we'll controls the government for you. they'll yeah. do it for you so 20 years 25 years from now so people should not worry about what's going on today Correct. start thinking 25 years from now Correct. if foreign Correct. brands own manufacturing capacity they are the ones employing your labor so they're the ones going to di dictate labor laws and government laws as well i think okay yeah so for me that's the strategy form side of this work is a lot of times people just want to engage in dialogue but there are real economic implications to decisions people are making today or not making um whether it's the diaspora and i tell them i'm just 2021 if we, if you and I check back 2021 December, I'm telling you, you see, you see the evidence of what I just said in Kano. You see it. I, 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 I <laughs> you think see, you see. With, I think with, with um, what what you've said, I, I'm already thinking of um, um, strategies on how to push. You know, you know, there's. There's also one thing we should we should know about Nigeria as a nation. Um, you see, when information comes, for instance, the AFT, AFCTFA has come now. Abuja epicenter. Then mm. maybe Lagos. Then maybe a few persons. It is in like five, ten years before, <laughs> for example, uh, a place like um, Kaduna, Kasina, you know, some, some places would yeah. actually realize that, oh, this has been happening for a really long time. long time. You know, I think that's one other issue that we have here. The information isn't really put through in the same ratio to everybody. Yes. Or, yes, maybe, is the, or maybe is the ignorance. Well, of... I, I'll, I'll put the responsibility on both sides because what you're saying, one, my, my mentee in Kaduna, this is what she told me, the same thing you said. She, and this is what she offered, right? She said, everything you're telling me, everything you're teaching me, us in the not, it's like, we, like it's, we don't even see it. We don't, nobody th thinks about us. The youth yeah. don't have anything in front of them. You know what that she was said? Why, that was why I came up with the Innovate Kano. Yeah. You know what yeah. she now said? She asked yeah. me, she said, can I, can I be your ambassador and be translating everything you're saying into AUSA? That's what she said. Because there's also a language barrier. Right? So unless the media or the leaders are taking this information and translating it um, into, into language. You There's see? a language barrier. Or, or it's either that or exactly. the education system educates them about the language with the world so they can go out there and fish for themselves. So there's also language barriers that a lot of the... Because Francophone Africa faced the same thing. A lot of times, like when I was doing my training with the African Union, they were asking me, they asked me, Tony, um, you're going to deliver this training in, in our message to the, to the rest of Africa, to the, to this, to the, um, member states, we need to also tell them in what language, Tony, are you going to deliver this training? Because there's Francophone, there's Portuguese, there's all kinds. So I was like, oh, Africa, you know, I'll speak English. Maybe later we'll find interpreters. <laughs> so the same thing happens, not just in Nigeria, but Francophone Africa they always lag a little behind the anglophone side 
because a lot of the innovation technology that is being deployed rapidly comes in through English and then they have to almost recreate those apps or innovation or technology and they are usually lagging behind. And, and the other thing is Nigeria doesn't need to reinvent it. When you just think about China, we lost him again. I'm sure he'll be back. Um, is, is that even China also has um, language barrier. So when you think about what China, when we think about what China has in terms of language barrier, we can learn from them as well because the Mandarin is their local language, but that's still, but they still have specialization in English that allows them to trade with the rest of the world. And a lot of times, even investors coming into China, you really have to work with, you know, translators and all of those things as well. So I think it's it's not really, it could be a barrier to trade, but if you have strategies in place, like what you're saying, ITC1, ITC2, and people that understand the local language and are able to translate to local content, that's that's important, very, very important, because language could easily be a barrier to trade, easily. But if people have strategy sure. to balance sure. it out, to mitigate it, then, then it becomes very fantastic. So those people, those joining us, if you have questions for Honorable and, and Tony, please drop it. I know it's very late, it's time, but wow, this has been fantastic. You and I can talk on and on. And part of why I set this up, this weekly engagement, is to give people insights into the types of dialogue, the private conversations I'm part of. Because sometimes people ask me, Tony, why are you so excited? It's gloomy out there. You know, COVID is here. Nigeria is this. There's nothing good happening out there. I'm like, come on, people. So sometimes, a lot of times, people actually wonder, like, why, why am I still, you know, so excited? Um, what, the work that we do at Nazaru, why does it still remain relevant? And it's because we see the type of work that is on ground that, that um, people like you, leaders are, like you are putting in place and we can come ahead and support because we know what it takes to take it to the next level. So we are here to partner, to support um, as well. So thank you again for, for saying yes when I invited you again, right? <laughs> this is not the first time and hopefully not the last Oh. I, I, I just, just having the conversation, I, I think you'll be hearing from me soon because I think we're going to come up with a strategy meeting. I'm going to call up His Excellency and ask what is the Kano State, what's can plan for the Krikan uh, Trade Continental <laughs> Trade Agreement? You know, I can, I can, guess, probably, I can almost probably guess. have, yes, and probably have um, a session where yes. I will bring will major players, including yourself. Okay, we are, we are ready. It's kind of ready. We are ready for that trade agreement. We are ready to push this because um, the truth is, we, we, we need to start having these discussions. You're correct. If we're not ready, the other African countries are ready for us. Yes, they are ready. They, they are, are getting ready. ready. And, and they tap into... The, the funny thing is that non-Nigerians non tap into my knowledge more than Nigeria. That's just a side... That's just a side thing. I'm telling you, you know. <laughs> it's so yeah. funny. I'm Happy. telling you. <laughs> you know, but just... I, I hear what you're trying to do, but just so you're not shocked or surprised, just be ready for him to turn around and say, oh, you go and put it together because here's the thing. There are conversations that have been part of at the yes. commissioner of commissioner of trade level. I'm telling you, they don't know what AFCFT is. And it's I would not put it on them. It's really the responsibility of the federal to disseminate this information in a way that is actionable. Right? In a way that is actionable. But right now it's not actionable. It's just um, it's just almost like a propaganda. It's it comes in as a propaganda, as an agenda. So yeah. people, people, yeah. people lose, yeah. people, people don't understand. So they're like, so what? In fact, a lot of the private sector that I engage with, it's it was until they saw me break it down and explain how it impacts their business. They're like, 
Aha, we thought it was one of those things for them. Now we are always hearing about Abuja this, you know, uh, agenda 2020 this, agenda this. So it's like people, people are so detached, emotionally detached from whatever Abuja is saying that they are not personalizing this message. They don't know oh. that it's about their business, right? So it's like, even when they read it on the newspaper, they are seeing it, but they are not seeing it. True. They are reading True. it, but they don't know that it is a gift to them. It's a gift to the private sector. Yeah. So the private sector do it not... It doesn't impact them directly, I think. So they think. And now... Some of the people, and I, I don't want to mention any names, actually one of the guests I brought in late last year, today, after I walked her through and I explained, and she was like, oh my goodness, now people are inviting her to TV stations to come and break down AFCFT. <laughs> because when you, when it's like, when you are informed and you see it, you become an advocate for it. I, I, I have actually taken an interest in it. Yeah. So that's that's the key. That's the yeah, key is that yeah. AFC. I've actually got an interest in AFC, it. Um, yeah, I'm I'm trying fact, to break it down. The leather, the leather work you're doing, is 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 AFCFTA relevant? Absolutely, AFCFTA re yes, relevant. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. It's 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 exactly. it's, it's, it's it, all you have exactly. to do is just is just map it to AFCFT and. The other thing I tell people is it's an easy way to actually get budget signed. Right now, if you can map your work to AFCFTA, I'm just putting that out there. Is if you say if you put it as um AFCFTA actualization agenda for Kano states, you know, put it there and you put your number, you will get it signed quickly. <laughs> and then give me a piece. I'll consult for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we, we we would we would look we would look into we would look into it as a state. We'll look into it as a state and give recommendations uh as partner states. Uh, what that means is um Kano State would look into it as a state. We would also um look into it as a partner state with Lagos State and see how uh, I know Lagos is is on you know, you know what's happening with Lagos? You know what's happening? You know what's happening with Lagos? Yeah, Lagos is going to be a recipient of AFCFT because Lagos is so exactly. super busy right now. They are so all they are doing is managing Lagos, right? Lagos may not consider that. Mm, maybe I don't need to think about like. Lagos City itself is so massive in terms of the commercial aspect that if the governor of Lagos doesn't create like a task force for AFCFTA, they're going to miss it. And if they miss it, it's okay because Lagos is the target destination for everybody. <laughs> so Lagos will be a recipient of everybody mm. trying to bring in their products to the market. So they're going to have their hands full. Lagos is going to have their hands full because for more foreign companies more African companies will be registering in Lagos because they will want a trade desk, right? A sales desk will be opened. More sales desks will be opened in Lagos. More transactions will be happening in Lagos because they'll be seeking wow. distributorship into the Lagos market, right? Because anybody that wants to penetrate Nigeria, they, their first stop is Lagos. So Lagos is going to be a recipient of all mm. things African because you will now see not just Chinese or Japanese or Europeans yeah. or, um, or American offices being opened in Lagos. You will see Morocco, Egyptian, South African, Ghanaian, Niger, on and on. Cameroon. You see businesses opened, yeah, which would well, which would drive. Well, yeah, it, well, already. yeah. So I I mean this is just well, super well, fascinating to me and um. We see Professor Joseph Mbele. Actually, remember I was telling you about this book? Um, he's the one that made a comment just now. Um, he's, he's Professor um, Joseph Mbele. And he said, let me bring his comment in. He said, this is a great conversation. 
a focus on a specific country and a specific industry. His book is um, called Africans and Americans Embracing Cultural Differences. So I'm sure he has enjoyed the conversation we've had about Kano and all of that. Thank you, Professor Joseph. He was a, one of my guests, I believe, two or three weeks ago. So he's following us very closely. Please say hi to him. Uh, I would like to read his book. You like to I read his like book, see? Okay. Awesome. So, uh, Professor Joseph, how are we going to get this book to I would like to Lagos? Read his book. Yeah. <laughs> you should send I me. I know a other people have asked. Yes. Yeah, okay. I'll give, yeah. If you send me your mailing address, I'll pass it on. Um, because other people have actually asked me, uh, Professor Joseph, even even um, mm -hmm. from Kaduna and different parts of Africa that you follow. Think, you think, think, so, what, what his please book, go on. What think his book, his book was precedence for, for uh, his book is going to set the precedence for, he's spoken about America. I mean, Next thing is going to be not just Africa, but probably Nigeria. Probably, mm. you know, relationship with, with all countries as it relates, you know, to mm. it. It's, it's just set the precedence for that, you know. I think, I think, um, I, 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 I am from the school of thought that, um, I would rather go to Oju and Legba where the hustle is real <laughs> under the bridges in Lagos and see how people are hustling than read a mm -hmm. book from um, someone that has never been to Nigeria does not know how to, to tell me how to make money. Mm. I would rather so. Mm. Um, what I'm trying to say is um, he, he has created a, that insight with, 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 I mean, by the title of his book, he has created that insight. I think it has also precedence for want to see what his future about a place like Nigeria or a place like Africa or, or mm. somewhere in Africa. What you said is so spot on because even in my last newsletter, because I send at least maybe once or twice a week, what I was also talking about when you think about cultural differences on, is that... Yeah, within the context of trade and investment, I'm telling the world now, you need market insights. You need to start educating yourself about Africans if you want to trade and engage with Africans. So what you're saying is spot on in terms of whether it's in Kano, whether it's in Lagos, market insight has to do with the customers we're hoping to serve, the people we're looking to do trade and investment with. How do they think? What are their affiliations? What do they love? All of that. So I'm seeing more of it come on the next couple of years. There are more market insights because in retail, where I come from, the more information you know about your customers, whether, you know, their demographic, their likes, their aspiration actually fits into business development, right? So it fits into international trade as well. The more insights you have with your customer profiles, the people you are looking to serve, the better. So absolutely what you're saying is spot on because we all need, even, even in Nigeria. So funny thing is, fun fact, I was actually born in Kaduna, right? And my husband is Igbo and I'm Yoruba. And many people cannot, um, they wrestle with those dynamics of cultural differences and all of that. So I connect and I relate differently yeah, with my brothers yeah. and sisters in the north because I'm one of them. But people don't know, like my birth certificate is Kaduna. <laughs> so I feel I'm one I'm, I'm one with the northern the northerners. So I relate with them, I engage with them, I mentor True. them, I listen to them. Even my siblings speak Ausa. So I wish I, I knew how to speak it. So we all now need to, be, before we can become one with one another, before we can become one with our fellow brothers and sisters, I think it starts with understanding one another, right? The reason you can do your job really well is because of your, your, your dynamic um, insights into the people of Kano, into the people of Lagos, right? The insights you have in, in terms of how the they culture. trade, the cultural, yes, so I think we, we need to go back 
and diversity. So diversity looks different for us in Africa, but it exists in our own unique ways. I'll let you. I'll let you have the last last words, last comments. Um, this has been really fun and engaging for me. <laughs> you know. Um. So, um, Tony, thank you so much. Um, it's been it's been fun and engaging, like you said. Um. Um. Our viewers will be seeing more of us very soon, um, because I'm doing. I've taken notes and um, <laughs> I'll be discussing with um, the governor and um, relevant commissioners and SSAs about getting on top of of this whole African trade uh, mm -hmm. um, opportunities that we see. You see, Kano, yes. Kano in the past suffered a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Someone was asking me, he said, has Boko I've never been to Kano. Oh man, mm. it first started in Kano. It mm. took a lot from Kano states. You know, mm. it took a lot from Kano states in 2005, 2006. It took a lot. But now Kano has recovered. Mm. It has recovered. It's 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 uh, connecting its people. It's pushing back investment. It's inviting partners. You know, I had someone recently that said, I I've never been to Kano. I was like, oh, you should try to go to Kano. And what do you do? He said, I sell jewelries and ah, Kano has cheap gold, you mm. know, and textiles and everything. And the person said, Kano, yes. ah, I'm not going to Kano. And like, no, no. Kanu. She said, No, you've never been to Kano, and yet you're she said, ah, the things we've said in the past. Now that is it. The past. You know, the past. But I can tell you that if you go and see. Um, it's amazing what government has done in Kano. It's amazing. I'm telling you, it's it's. I I I left Kano in 2003. Kano in 2018. It was ah, where did all these bridges come from? Underpasses, street lights, you know, development. I mean, the whole the whole today. Innovation, you know, the, mm. today's infrastructure, it's there. I was amazed, you know. And today, you could say the governor of Kano State has, um, he has concentrated education for the girl child, most especially for the child. He has concentrated on uh, infrastructure, on uh, rural development. Uh, we have, we're building our own BRT lanes in Kano. Um, security is being transformed in Kano, you know, community relations, inter-community relationships, you know, so yes, um, but I have not been to Kano, please, you need to, there's so much things in Kano, they age for that, they snow that, the Niger, I mean, with the train line running through, through um, Niger, to Kano, Kasina, Jigawa, they know, they know the trade opportunities in Kano, and that's why they keep coming, you know. So, um, please, the conversation going to it, and um, you'll be hearing more opportunities that come out of Kano, you know. Oh, fantastic. And, I look forward to it. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Tony. Oh, thank you. Thank you, sir. It's been such an honor. Again, like you said, uh, my community, we want to learn more. That's I want my community and the membership network to be the most, you know, aware of, of what's going on. And even for me as well, what I also offer, we actually have direct channels to the AFCFTA um, as well. Um, the Commissioner for um, African Union, the, um, you know, Commissioner for Trade and Industry, nice, nice. He, when he came to Chicago at my invitation, he came and delivered a keynote address on AFCFTA. He brought a bag, a bag of these pins of the AFCFTA oh, for me. Nice, and nice. so, so we do, nice. we do have a lot of um, knowledge base in terms of an AFCFTA roundtable that we've hosted. We have information on you. Um, UN um, Conference on Trade and Development, um, you know, World Bank. So if you also need that kind of content, that's, those are things, because 
people are wondering right now if i want to adopt afcfta where do we go in terms of strategic yeah. implementation so those are some of the things we are putting together as well as a go-to right. resource for right. implementation and even um we, we also teach trade and investment facilitation you know that's so i know a lot of the activities i engage with people are like why is towing you know what stories be you know but it's because we we have to empower ourselves with knowledge and a lot of the policies that are currently in place in africa we need to sweep it away because those policies um do not favor the people of africa in a way so we have to start crafting new policies that are focused on trade not aid and investment because that's really the secret to to the future of cities sure. and states um, across the continent. So um, thank you again for coming. Uh, it's such an honor, um, such thank a privilege. You. And you have my office um, ready to jump in if you need us. And oh, very I I'm sure we'll be so doing. Fun. Okay, awesome. Very <laughs> okay, very thank, you. thank you so much. On that note, um, we're going to, good. awesome. So we're going to wrap up. Oh no, thank you, thank you. My it's it's my honor. Ladies and gentlemen, again, Honorable Chief Antoni Onea, the SSA to the governor of Kano State on Lagos Affairs. It's just been a delight. And I want to thank you again. Many people may not realize the first 20 minutes that we had offline of me trailing you in your car as you were going home. And I was like, okay, I'll follow you home so that you can come live. <laughs> So people may not realize, you know, your graciousness to just, you know, take take this um, because I know it was rush hour. So, but thank you, I really do appreciate, um, you know, your dedication and and making it a, a call, putting it on your agenda to no. be here today. Thank you. Sir.